The first act that Jesus did once he entered into Jerusalem was go to the temple and there cleanse the temple from all the defilement that was there. Now you have to appreciate what Jesus confronted when he walked into the temple area. There were merchants selling what I'll call Passover stuff. Passover had become quite commercialized by the time of Jesus and not the very solemn and joyful celebration that it had been historically. There were money changers exchanging currency in the temple because pilgrims coming to Jerusalem, uh, either the currency of their country that they came from or the Roman currency was considered to be unclean by the, uh, uh, by the authorities. So currency had to be exchanged for temple currency, which was clean but it was being exchanged at an ex at exorbitant rates for most people. So the temple had become more marketplace than worship center. And Passover had become more business than prayer. Now when we read in Matthew chapter 21, as we continue reading, at verse 12, Jesus went into the temple and drew out those buying and selling he overturned the tables of the money changers and the chairs of those selling doves. He said to them, It is written, My house will be called a house of prayer, but you are making it a den of thieves. Now, are you troubled by what has become of the holy days? You would call them holidays, but the holy days in our time. Let me give you an example. I think retailers have co-opted Christmas and Easter and thoroughly secularized them for most people. We've largely forgotten some of the seasonal emphases like Advent, Lent, Easter, Pentecost. Even the Lord's Day itself is no longer considered a special day. We've replaced the Christian calendar with the Hallmark calendar. And so the more important kinds of days that appear on the Hallmark calendar are things like Mother's Day, Father's Day, Veterans Day, Independence Day, Cinco de Mayo, even National Hot Dog Day. Now, here we are on Monday at the beginning of Holy Week. And Holy Week is the commemoration, the remembrance of Jesus' last days before his betrayal and execution on Friday and his resurrection on Sunday, the first day of the week, what we now call the Lord's Day. Now, we Christians in many ways are complicit with our culture in substituting holy day, holidays for holy days. We've secularized the, the whole event for most of us. Some so-called Christians come to church only twice a year on Easter and Sunday. We took the pearl of great price to the store where we bought it, got our money back. I suspect that uh, we found the treasure in a field and returned so that we could bury it where we found it. I suspect that some of us may be finding that our religion is more like the shot that is supposed to keep us from getting the flu. Our religion is an inoculation that keeps us from getting the real deal Christianity that our souls long for. If living in the coronavirus pandemic has an upside, it is that the threat of sickness and death has moved us. We're huddling together with our families more. We're praying for safety, praying for those that we may know who are ill at this time. We're checking on each other more regularly, making more phone calls and such. Maybe we're even thinking more about Jesus' death and resurrection, what it means not only to us, but to the whole world. So let me ask you, are you reading your Bible more? Are you praying more fervently than before? Are you looking forward to heaven when life is over here? Does the pandemic have you thinking about making some changes in your life that will last beyond the crisis of our time? Do you want to grow in the grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ? Well, Jesus 
cleanse the temple for a purpose. He had a reason for doing it. He wanted to show us what to do when a church is no longer the church. Now, you got to hear that again. That's a key idea for me right now. What to do when a church is no longer the church. What to do when we realize that some of what we do as a church is more institutional and superficial than it is inspirational and spiritual. For Jesus going to the temple that day, it was to revive the God-given, unchanging purpose for the temple. If you have your Bibles open, look at verse 13 again. It tells us, he said to them, it is written, that is the Bible says, my house shall be called a house of prayer. That's the quotation. That's the thought. But then he said, but you are making it a den of thieves. My house will be called a house of prayer, but you're making it a den of thieves. He's telling us, what we must do to follow Jesus is simply seek revival. Let's talk about being a house of prayer for just a moment. In Matthew chapter 16, Jesus gave his church the keys of the kingdom of heaven. And he told us something that sounds a little bit mysterious, maybe a little bit odd to us. He said, whatever we may bind or loose on earth, will have already been bound or loosed in heaven. Now, I want to encourage you to remind yourself by going back to Matthew chapter 16, verses 18 and 19, and Matthew, and Matthew chapter 18, verses 18 and 19, just to reread it and, and renew your understanding of what this is. Clearly, the word picture of binding and loosing refers to praying strategically praying in a way that accomplishes the purpose and the plan of God, Play, praying in a way that conforms us to God's plan and his purpose. His church permits or prohibits on earth what is already permitted or prohibited in heaven by our prayers. We use prayer to accomplish this thing that Jesus said we would do because we are his church. Praying like this could be one of those truly awesome realities. And, and I don't mean awesome like chocolate cake is awesome. Tony Evans says, we bring heaven's perspective to bear on life on earth. We're an embassy for the kingdom of heaven on earth. And a true church represents heaven's concerns on earth here and now. And helps to bring those concerns into reality here and now. Our prayers are a kind of conduit for God's concerns to become reality right here, right now, in our neighborhood, not only among us in the church, but out there in the community where we, where we live and work. Now, Solomon's dedication of the newly constructed temple is well worth remembering if you want to consider the God-given unchanging purposes that God has for his church. So 2 Chronicles chapter 7, verses 12 through 15, I'm reading from the Christian Standard Bible, says, The Lord appeared to Solomon at night and said to him, I have heard your prayer and have chosen this place for myself as a temple of sacrifice. If I shut the heaven so that there is no rain, or if I command the grasshopper to consume the land, or if I send pestilence on my people, and my people who bear my name humble themselves, pray and seek my face, and turn from their evil ways, then I will hear from heaven, forgive their sin, and heal their land. My eyes will now be open and my ears attentive to prayer from this place. You see, God purposed for us, his people, his church, 
to be a house of prayer. Listen to Matthew as he tells us then what could happen if we were truly a house of prayer. Verses 14 through 17 in Matthew 21. The blind and the lame came to him in the temple, and he healed them. And when the chief priests and the scribes saw the wonders that he did, and the children shouting in the temple, Hosanna to the son of David, they were indignant and said to him, Do you hear what these children are saying? Jesus replied, Yes. Have you never read? You have prepared praise from the mouths of infants and nursing babies. Then he left them, went out of the city to Bethany, and he spent the night there. That's the end of his triumphal entry into Jerusalem. That is the conclusion of his going to cleanse the temple and to set the stage for what is to come throughout the rest of the week. Salvation and healing for those who see our church being, a ch being the church in the world and becoming a house of prayer. The takeaway, I think, is crystal clear. His church... We members of his church are meant to be this house of prayer. And so we can learn to pray and praise him as a priority in life, as a first of all things that we do kind of experience, kind of practice. We can ask him to do his will on earth as it always is done in heaven. He even taught us to pray using language similar to that. But we must believe that we are his chosen conduit for bringing his will to bear on earth. God has chosen his church to work through in order to accomplish his will in our world. May God bless us as we choose to become the house of prayer that he said we would be, that we should be. Our Father, we bow in your presence. We magnify your name. We glorify in the cross. We look forward to not only this celebration of Easter coming up Sunday, but we rejoice in the goodness and grace you shower us with and for the promise of heaven when we come to the end of this life. We pray, our Father, that you bless this week that as we continue to read through the scriptures, you will speak to our hearts, you will teach us truth, and you will give us your blessing in life. So we give you thanks and praise in the name that is above all names, the matchless and marvelous name of Jesus, our Lord and Savior. Amen.